So hi, my name is David Simpson. Uh, I'm one of the DB2 instructors at Themis. Uh, today I have with me Linda Clausen, who is uh, another one of our DB2 instructors and courseware developers. And we're here to talk a little bit today about um, some of the material we've been developing and, and delivering an awful lot lately, and that is for DB2 stored procedures and the new uh, trends and directions that we have, particularly with DB2 version 9, um, with the native SQL PL stored procedures and then the enhancements to that that are coming in in version 10. Uh, so we could start, I guess, by talking about, uh, you know, the difference between a native SQL PL stored procedure and what we now refer to as external stored procedures that were, um, you know, we wrote in COBOL or, or some other language. So, you know, maybe talk a little bit about the difference between the two and, and how the native ones can help us. Well, native SQL procedures are written exclusively in DB2's native SQL procedural language, right. which means we don't have source code. We don't have uh, a historical COBOL or PL1 source code. Right. And the entire thing is coded in the single create statement. And when we develop them and deploy them, they run directly in the database manager. There is no external workload manager right. space requirement. And that's a key difference, right? That the, the external, when I write a procedure in COBOL, IBM won't let me put that inside the DB2 engine because I could do bad things that's to right. DB2, right? Um, because these SQL store procedures are interpreted code, essentially, and IBM has more control of the environment, they let me actually put it inside DB2, which you know cuts down on the overhead of task switching and going back and forth in and out of DB2. So uh, we can see some benefit right there, right? Especially if the procedure is fairly simple. Yeah. If this procedure is relatively simple, we have uh, moderate to small amounts of if-then-else logic or case right. expressions, uh, then that if-then-else logic is bound directly into the plan with the SQL statements mm -hmm. and stored in bytecode in the um, Package in the and package, right? in the package, inside the package, right inside the package. Package is loaded directly into the database manager and executed there. Now, there's another advantage to this if you're calling those stored procedures from the distributed environment through TCP IP, hmm. that is also offloadable to the zip, right? So, so that was a disadvantage of, of using stored procedures historically, was especially since the advent of the zip, is if I'm writing a Java program, if it did the SQL natively and it would be zip eligible, if it goes out and calls a stored procedure, a COBOL stored procedure, we're all of a sudden not zip eligible anymore, Correct. right? Correct. So, so now if we, in version 9, if we use the native procedures, if the caller was zip eligible, the stored mm -hmm. procedure will also be zip eligible. And that's, that's a key distinction. Right? It's not every, not all of these are zip eligible yeah. if the caller was, was zip eligible. What, yeah. what I'm really enjoying is some of our clients who we've taught and mm -hmm. helped set up the native SQL procedure environment are experiencing an average of at least 40% offload to the ZIP. Right. So maybe we should actually talk a little bit about the ZIP processor and what that means. Uh, it's been around for a few years now, but um, at one user group that I was at uh, just a few weeks ago, there was a tremendous amount of interest in, you know, I hear this term ZIP being kicked around in the DB2. You know what the heck is a zip <laughs> what what does that mean well it's another processing unit mm. but the zip processor is a cheaper processor number mm. one and number two all the work that is done on that processing unit the zip unit mm. uh, does not go against your software billable cost right so that brings down the cost of what is processing over there so i can add capacity without paying for that capacity in full anyway. Correct, and correct. It's, it's a, a, when we say cheaper, we're talking a lot cheaper, right? Yes, we are. Right. We're talking significant amount of dollar, and right now IBM is pushing, and I like to see them push this, the reduction of the total cost of your computing. So the more uh, computing power we can put on the cheaper zip that doesn't mm -hmm. go against our software billables right. time, the better off we are, and the happier our financial environment right. will be. So, so if, I, if I have ZIP engines, which are really the hardware for those is the yeah. same as the, the regular CPs that we put in our mainframes, it's just configured differently to run Correct. certain types of workload. Correct. And so if I, can, if I can write things that will run in that workload 
or, or as zip eligible, um, then I'm, I'm running on cheaper CPU, uh, a lot cheaper CPU. So we may actually do some things, you know, when we say the native SQL store procedures are zip eligible, maybe we'll even write stuff in that language, even when COBOL might outperform it just on the stopwatch, right? If it's, it's going to reduce my cost of computing, you bet. Yeah. And yeah. we're not seeing, except for those COBOL programs that have massive amounts of uh, logic code. Procedural code. Procedural yeah. code in them. Because COBOL's really good at that. Yeah. They're very good at yeah. that. Um, we're seeing a significant amount of improvement in performance in those zips, especially as we go from 9 to 10. Right. Now, see, get more I'm, efficiencies with the SQL PI. We're seeing 10. another, uh, close to another 20% of performance improvement in the uh, SQL SQL. And that's stuff we get for free just because IBM got better at that's uh, interpreting right. that code. Each, yeah. each release of DB2 gets yeah. better. Yeah. And version 9 gave us the new functionality. Right. And now 10 is improving the performance. Right. So, so that's when we talk about improving performance on our system, we might not be necessarily talking about using less CPU, we might be talking about what kind of CPU are we using, Correct. cheap stuff or expensive stuff. So that zip discussion um, is, is something I think is going to continue, you know, be able to write code that goes off to those specialty processors and then therefore costs us less. That's right, and it's going to also influence people in their migrations from release to release, especially as IBM is is working very hard to get more and more of the DB2 processes, including utilities, running on the zip right. instead of in the main. So IBM is, is further expanding what can run on the zip. Correct. And, and that's, that's a decision they make kind of based on marketing criteria, right? Like yes, what, it is. What do they want to be less expensive mm -hmm. uh, for us? And so you can kind of gauge by the types of workloads they'll yeah. let go over there uh, where they're trying to help us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, there's another thing with native SQL procedures I think a lot of people overlook is the human factor. We have a significant amount of mid-tier developers out there mm -hmm. that don't know COBOL, that do, don't know PL1. They're right. developing web applications, uh, your net, that data you know, applications mm -hmm. and, and all these things. And they don't know in. how to log on to TSO. They know SQL, yeah. but they don't know <laughs> TSO and they don't know the mainframe. And, and they don't want to know And they TSO. don't want to know. <laughs> yeah. With native SQL procedures, with the free tools IBM has supplied, they are common front-end workbench tools. Yeah. Eclipse-based data yeah, studio. Eclipse-based. Right? Yeah. They can develop the stored native SQL procedure, deploy it on the mainframe, test it from that tool, mm -hmm. debug it from that tool, and they don't and have to done. log on to the mainframe. And they yeah. never have to log on to the mainframe. Right. And we have full explain capabilities in, as a DBA to watch what they're doing. Right. But it's Click, yeah, done. That's right. And we can use those personnel to do a lot of that front end development then. Right. Um, so from like the, the database administrator's perspective or the, the system install person's perspective, mm -hmm. we could maybe talk a little bit about what are some of the things I have to watch for as we get more and more of this native SQL PL out there. Right. So if the developers are doing this without telling us, you know, we're going to notice some things, right? Oh, we're going to notice <laughs> things. We're going to have to monitor a little bit closer. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to make sure certain features that native SQL procedures are capable of doing, like declaring uh, global temporary tables. Yeah. That maybe uh, in our work file database now, we may want to put some limits on our temp that right. the individual user can use. And the other thing is, is one of the advantages that the workload managed COBOL stored procedures had was the fact that those could not bring my DB2 subsystem down. Right, because they're outside of DB2. They're, they're off outside their own of DB2 world. and right. they're fenced. Yep. Now I have code going directly into the database manager. Right. And if they get in a massive loop, right. we're looping inside the DB2 engine. Right. So we want to make sure that whatever the templates are they're using for the stored procedures, we've set up limits on the uh, ASU time, right? the service unit's time they're allowed to eat before we blow them out and of the water. You know, that's interesting because you know? in the classes we do on the SQL PL stored procedures, we do one that actually has both COBOL and SQL PL. But in SQL PL, we always, it never fails when I teach one of those classes, somebody puts one of those things into an infinite loop. So your, your ASU time 
which is you know your maximum amount of time that, that the procedure is allowed to consume is important especially in that environment. It is very important. And because and it's inside DB2. It's yeah. inside a DB2 and that could bring DB2 down, yeah. theoretically. Yeah, um, run I haven't had, yeah, <laughs> I, I've been able to catch them all before that. <laughs> right. And I hate to say this, but back when I started, the COBOL programs used to do that when they first started sure. too. <laughs> We've just, just learned a lot more. Yeah, I mean, yep. perform until is a fairly well understood thing now. And actually you have three or four different looping mechanisms in SQL PL yes, you do. that all behave kind of differently. Slightly yeah. different with a different approach and a different logic. Right, to them, and a different so. way to get out. <laughs> right, yeah, so. and it's the exit that they, they that, miss so they, much. They always miss. And the other thing is, is about your native SQL procedures is with the code, the logic code being inside the package with the SQL, mm. that means your packages are getting bigger. Right. And that could be a lot bigger. A right? lot. If you bigger. had a lot of procedural code in there. The more yeah. procedural code, the larger it gets, and that has an effect on the DB2 directory in the skeleton uh, package table, and mm. also loading into your EDM pool. Right. They will be larger. So, so yeah, and that's probably the EDM pool <clears> is the <throat> one we need to think about the most because you know that's that's performance in real time if I don't have that size big enough to accept these much larger packages. That's correct. And the packages are larger because all the procedural <coughs> code and the SQL is all bound up together in the same package, right? And but then, we used to separate those into a load module and a, an SQL correct, package. Yeah. Correct. And the other thing with the skeleton uh, package table in the directory, remember in version 9 that's still 64 gig limit. So we've had to go to compression on right. the environments that we've wanted to implement quite a few native SQL procedures. Where with version 10, with the uh, skeleton uh, cursor table, package table, sorry, um, being restructured, we won't have to do that compression mm. because IBM has changed it to include lob columns and with the two large object columns in uh, skeleton package table, one a clob, one a blob, for the binary code that right. gets interpreted uh, loaded and interpreted, then that uh, requirement goes away. Right, but we still got to load all that into the EDM pool <clears> when <throat> yes, the thing runs, it does. right? But the good news is it's up above the bar. Right. So, uh, you know. And we really needed that 64 bit Address. problem solved for, for this to be, for us to be able to run these things natively inside DB2. Correct. Correct. Otherwise, we could have overwhelmed DB2 below the bar. Yeah. yeah. And in version when we moved to version 10, remember 90% of the entire database manager address space is above most of the, the EDM bar. Pool, yeah. EDM pool, everything, yeah. and even your uh, package tables and all of that up above the bar. Right. So we have two classes at Themis that really go into this stuff in some detail. The, the store procedure options class, which combines the COBOL and the native. And then we have one called exploiting native SQL PL store procedures. Uh, which is targeted at version 9 and using the, the newer yep. features. And I have been adding, and I will have added, uh, the version 10 improvements, which are small, most of it's under the covers. Right. And uh, no change. And there are some nuances in SQL mm -hmm. PLS, particularly with error handling and things like that, yes. that are a little bit different than what traditional procedural coders might mm -hmm. be used to. Uh, so it's important to get that stuff right. Um, it is. When we start getting into this language. so. Um, we hope you'll join us in, in one of those classes uh, in the near future. Thanks. Have a good